Praise the Lord, Bethlehem. Hallelujah. Come on, can we put our hands together? Come on, we can do better than that. Is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Can we stand for worship? Come on, put your hands together. I want to clap my hands a louder than before. I want to clap my hands a louder than before. Free. Freedom, 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 say, freedom, freedom, freedom. Freedom, 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 Do we have any free people in the house of the Lord this morning? No more shackles. No more bondage. Have any free people in the house of the Lord this morning? Freedom! 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 No more shackles! No more shackles. No more shackles. No more chains. No more bondage. I am free. Thank God I'm free. I am free.
Come on, hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and the heaven. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and in his praise in the congregation of saints. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, the day that you have made. This day, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come to worship you in this place at this time to exalt your holy name to praise and to honor your presence with our hearts and our minds on you and dear lord we thank you for the gift of salvation we thank you for the gift of jesus the one who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us lift our voices and sing. Lift every voice and sing. Page 532.
this morning, we welcome any the visitors to our um, service this morning. So if we have any visitors here, would you please stand? Well, we also would like to acknowledge uh, our online visitors as well. We will do our usual wave and greet everyone. At this time, we should have a word from Pastor Burke. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you this cool, cold Sunday morning. It is a day in which we acknowledge heart disease and its impact on our community. It's Go Red Sunday. Go Red people, please stand if you're able. Even if you're not wearing red today, we'll raise our hands. <laughs> we certainly want to support heart disease. Anything that can ease that burden is the leading cause of death in this country, particularly among people who look like us. So it's very important that we observe, but also that we examine and that we get the care that's out there for us. Today we also are thankful that in the midst of so much in the world that we're able to gather. We've had a, a number of bereavements in our, in our congregation over the last weeks, and we thank God in spite of that because we are still standing together. Continue to pray for one another, visit, call, don't forget that the process has just begun, so still keep re reaching for people and out to people. So this day, as we continue in the season of Lent and observing Black History Month at the same time, I wish that all of you would find moments with yourself in God. Take seriously this call of Isaiah that we should, should, we really should indeed spend some time thinking about what God has done. We should take some time then thinking about what we could have done differently and make this season of Lent profitable by doing something that reflects that you understand the greatness of our God and how God has cared for all of us. God bless you. Announcements. Sister Rose Hennett, followed by the offertorial prayer, Digan Walter Ben. Then we will have scripture and prayer by Digan S. Gertrude Waller in that order. Good morning, Bethlehem. As a reminder, following our worship service, there will be a special call church conference to vote on the pastor. We're asking you to remain after the service and to be patient as we prepare for the vote. Parents, don't forget to bring your elementary and middle school children to the open house on Saturday. Uh, is this coming Saturday at 11 a.m.? Um, the bulletin is noted 10, but it is at 11 a.m. Your prince is looking forward to seeing each of you. Again, we express condolences to Deaconess Ethel Green and family in the passing of her brother, Malachi Dunk. Funeral services are incomplete at this time. Our church secretary will email us once we are notified. We also express condolences to the Simmons family Mason family and Hobbs family, in the passing of their cousin, Wallace Munford. His celebration of life is Wednesday, 1 p.m. at the Mims Funeral Home. If you can, we are asking that you please support the family. We also ask that you keep all of our bereaved families in prayer. The Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Omega Rho, Omega chapter and the AARP has partnered to provide free tax assistance. The only requirement is that you need the help. I have copies of the flyer with all the pertinent information on it. 
If you need the help or know someone that needs that help, please take advantage of this free service. I also did receive an update. Um, there are very few slots left, so please take one of these flyers. Please continue to read your bulletin and visit the website for all upcoming events in the life of our church. Bethlehem, make it a great day. Good morning, Bethlehem. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to come into the house and worship. Lord, continue to bless us as we go through our day. Lord, we thank you for all you have given us, and we're thanking you for what you're going to give us in the future. Lord, touch those who need to be touched, and that's everybody in the world. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. in Bethlehem. Our scripture this morning is coming from Isaiah 58 verses 1 through 12. And you can stand in reverence of the word of God. And it reads, Shout aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion, and to the descendants of David their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager, to, and seem eager for God to come near them. Why, we have, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have you humbled, your, humbled ourselves, and, we have not, and you have not noticed it? Noticed. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves. Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day ex acceptable to the Lord? Is it is is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your life will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your real God. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in, in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in sun-scorched land, in a sun-scorched land, 
and will strengthen your frame. <clears throat> you will be like water. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will reveal the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearer of his holy word. <clears throat> Let us bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come now just to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for not another opportunity, Lord, to be in your presence. We just thank you, Lord, for being God all by yourself. As we bind our minds to the mind of Christ and our wills to the will of God, that we may go forth, Lord Jesus, doing what it is that you would have us to do. We just pray for this church called Bethlehem, Lord Jesus. We pray that whatever we do, whatever we say, it's all for your glory, Lord. We just thank you in advance for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen.
praise the Lord. The choir will continue with the musical offering, and then we will have the preach word by Dr. Burke. Lord, I want you to help me. 
Oh, oh my journey. Can anybody help me, Lord? Help me on my journey. Can anybody help me, Lord? Help me, Lord, on this journey. Help me on my way. On this journey, Lord, help me on my way, Lord. I need your help this morning. Come on and help me, Lord. Oh, Lord, I need your help, Lord. While on this journey, come on, Lord. I say, our plea this morning <laughs> that he would help us Amen. in all the ways that we need help. Amen. Well, thank you choir musicians and thank all of you for being a part of this worship thus far. Now, you have heard the scripture reading, Isaiah 58, 1 through 12, and um, you know, the scripture is probably longer than the message today, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, Isaiah 58, 1 through 12, and I will share through verses, through verse 5. That is 58, 1 through 5. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion to the house of Jacob, their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself. Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in, on sackcloth and ashes. Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Let us pray. God, we thank you for blessing us so richly. We thank you, Lord, for this time, for this opportunity to share with you. We thank you, God, for all that have gathered. Lord, we ask now that you speak. Speak through this, your preacher, that all of us might hear and that we might do your will. In the name of the one who orders our steps, amen. amen. As you know, this month of February 2024 is a rich one for us. You know, we just begun Lent. We um, had our Ash Wednesday. People, you know, repented, and I hope we're still in repentance mode. But we 
of being reminded today by this prophet that is more than just a show. That is more than just looking pious. It's more than just sending a message to other people through your behavior that you are now in repentance. Basically, Isaiah is saying, well, show me. Don't just talk about it, show me. So the fast that matters is not the one that garners the most attention. It's not the one that causes people to look at you and you only and not think about God. But the fast that matters, which is our subject, the fast that matters, is the one that reflects a heart that is truly repentant to God. And as such, causes one to act and behave in the world in such a way that people know that you've been changed. The fast that matters. You see, while we have all this going on, Ash Wednesday, Lent, and it's Black History Month, you know, Isaiah in this prophetic literature seeks to make the point that God is never pleased when people offer a series of carefully orchestrated religious observances rather than be and in pursuit of him and of the justice and righteousness that he requires. In other words, it gets to be about how it looks. Lent, so I'm going to give up something. Lent, I'm going to do something different for these 40 days. Lent, I want people to see what I'm doing, so it needs to be visible. But Isaiah is helping the people to rem remember even then that if this is all it means to you, then you have missed the point. You know, he, he reminds them that, that, we, you know, that we are in pursuit of justice and righteousness, not only for ourselves, but for the neediest members of our society. You know, most people in their mind, when they think about giving up something, it's about them. When they think about what I'm doing during this time, it's not about what we are called to do. That is to be the one that makes sure that life is as equitable as possible for all people. If we truly understand what God is doing here, then we are going to get ourselves right so that we can make some things right in the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is our time to think and reflect on what God has done and is doing in us so that we can change the world the way that he demands that it be changed, is that, that those that are up come down and those that are down come up, and that everybody use every gift they've gotten, that others might understand what God is doing for them and for all of humanity. And so he takes the time here to, in those first two verses, to rebuke, to rebuke those people of Israel who, is, who say they want to be close to God, but are unwilling to obey the most basic of God's commands, which is caring for one's neighbors. In verses 3 and 4, Isaiah describes those people who wonder why God seems to care so little about and pay so little attention to their religious activities. In this case, it is the ritual of fasting. So even then, you have those people that said, this is what God requires, so I'm going to fast in such a way that everybody knows I'm fasting. I'm going to brag to everybody about what I'm giving up and how much it costs me to give it up. I'm going to let everybody know that this is my offering. And Isaiah has a counter to that. He says the truth is, that God is far more concerned about people of faith working for justice and, and doing for others than them putting on a posture they think is pleasing to God. You know what? Some people live and act as if the fact that they show up at church every now and then is enough. <laughs> that they show up when it's convenient is enough. He's talking about those people that think I have shown who I am because I showed up there. But Isaiah said, but where were you when we were feeding the hungry? Where were you when we needed people to go to the schools and talk to people who are just so stressed they don't know what else to do? 
Now Isaiah is saying it's nice to do those things. Give up what you want to give up. But if, if it does not cause you to be more about the cause of God, and that is God who is for everybody, then you are missing the point. We know we are a country that's full, and many others are, of great cathedrals. But when it comes to what people really need, we don't see them. We don't see those. Because for some people, the only thing that matters is what I do in my temple, that other people in the temple can see me do that. You know, some people won't give a dime to the church except that they can brag that they did. This is what he's talking about. He said those that get it will do it because they know who God is. They know what God requires. They'll make the sacrifice and then not brag about it and not complain about it. Do you hear what I'm saying? So he's saying, if, you, if you're going to fast, then make it mean something. If you're going to give up something, then give out something. If you're going to use this time in prayer and seeking God, then seek God for what you might do that would change somebody else's mind that would let somebody else know that our God does care for us. You know how I know God cares for us? Because God sent those people that don't even speak to me to help me. Do you see what I'm saying? That, that the fast itself, it helps you if you are really invest yourself in it and realize that the words are for you. It ought to change you year by year. We ought to get a little stronger and have more resolve about those things that God would have us to do. So, so, so the, the, the fast that matters is one that reflects those things that God was about. And God was about people having what people need, not one group over another, not one that has everything and others have none. We are the equalizers. The fast that matters is one that will get out there shoulder to shoulder with people that have need to make sure that everybody has just enough. So Jesus clearly understood this. He understood that people need to know something other than just what look, makes them look good. And you know, we know people that are good at assuming the posture. You know, everything changes when somebody's looking. But Isaiah is saying, no, 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 no. It's what you do when nobody's looking. It's what you do because you love God, whether it's raining or it's snowing or whatever it is. It, 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 it's, it's what you do that's really inconvenient for you, but you do it because you know God requires that of you in that moment. He reminds us that, that fasting ought to be done in a way that does not draw attention to ourselves. Remember Matthew in the 16th chapter, 16 through 18? He says that, you know, don't do it as a public show. And some people got an elaborate show when they want people <laughs> to see how pious they are. So, but so he was, he was reminding them that people wanted to be seen going through the motions of doing what God requires. Amen. And we have those people. You put out a plea, we need this. They'll do it if there's a crowd to see them raise their hand. They'll do it if their name gets announced for doing it. But ask them to give anonymously because God requires it. And you draw a different crowd. You draw the crowd that's giving more than those that could give more. Do you know in this country, it is the average everyday people, percentage-wise, give much, much more to charities than wealthy people, all right? Same with volunteerism. A lot of those that have much don't give much, but they get credit for every little thing they do because they got the publicity. We must learn to do because God has put it in us to do it. We must learn the power that we have when we join together. We as a people, let's look back at our month, our, what we celebrate this month. We as a people have become experts with doing a lot without much. In fact, we, we, as, as folks used to say, we can take a little or nothing 
I make something. You know, and, th and that's God. No matter what situation we found ourselves in, Amen. God always provided just enough or just enough, just one person or somebody who could help us get over that hump. You know, under you understand, we haven't always had it this way. Remember back in the day, anybody from the country remember when, when almost nobody could afford a funeral. Well, what did they do? They started burial societies. The idea of Maggie Walker and the burial society, people couldn't afford funerals. So let them give some money every month so there's a pool where everybody who's in it gets a certain amount of money when somebody dies. You know, some of those might still exist because we, we have that kind of need. Think about it. As we look around now with all the things that happen with people, who's ready? Who's ready to lose their children? Who's prepared for that? So there are some things that people do quietly. I'm not saying people don't, but remember that part of our giving is, is that we give it because it's in our hearts to give it. And we give it without fanfare to make sure that others have. Now, Jesus, again, makes sure that we understand that you give not for your own attention, not to lift yourself up, to remind people that there is a love that's greater than any love they have known that provides for them in all situations. So he, he's concerned because he can see all these people got the posture but yet things are not being done that ought to be done. We find similar messages at, at the heart of some of Amos' message and Micah and others, where we are reminded that it's not so much how much we do, but the spirit with, that it comes from. If it comes truly from the heart, that's what matters. So we can, we can do whatever we choose to do with this Lent and with this fasting. But we also got to deal with the repenting. Some people get all right until you talk about repenting. Because most of us don't want to admit that we are wrong. And we definitely don't want to admit that we've been wrong a long time. <laughs> that can be a problem. But we must, do, we must do that. We use this season to look back. And we celebrate all the wonderful things that God has done for us. But when we, when we turn around and get it right, We've got to also acknowledge that many things happened for us. Many things happened that lifted us up out of a situation that we didn't deserve. But we serve a God who's gracious and, and gives us mercy when we need it. That we benefited from somebody else's understanding that I'm going to help him or her even though they don't speak to me half the time. That I am going to do what needs to be done for these people, not because... They look or live where I want them to be, but because I'm required to go out and help those that need help without regard for location or circumstance. We're reminded, too, that Isaiah wants them to consider the fact that, that there must also be some personal humility that goes with this. So when we focus only on the act that benefits us, are we really doing what God requires of us? Are we really doing it when we only do enough to get our name put on the road? When we're only doing enough for somebody to call our name, if you don't call my name, I'm not going to never give them anything again. It's about how we do it. The truly repentant will understand that it always has to begin within. If we can't ever see our own wrong, who are we to go out and try to tell other people about their right and their wrong? And we know people, you know, some people still function like, some, like little children until they know better. You know, I want everything I see. I see everything, so everything is mine. And that's not the spirit that we want here. And, and so, so if we're going to contribute in a way that pleases God, we have to be willing to hold ourselves to the same standard that we hold others. We have to see our own wrong in something. We have to acknowledge to ourselves and sometimes somebody else that we probably didn't handle that the right way. What is this among Christians 
that causes them to have a pride that says, I'm never going to admit I'm wrong no matter how many people know I'm wrong. We, it's, it's something missing. Almost like somebody we see on TV a lot. Yeah, I stole the money, so why y'all coming after me for the money, you know? <laughs> I mean, we got people like that. But what God requires of us is that we recognize, first of all, our own sinfulness. That we get to a point where it's not somebody, nobody has, think of after a while, so I'm going to talk, talk to some of the folk my age and older. We got to a point where people didn't have to tell us we were wrong, right? Because whether we acted like it or not, we knew we were wrong. <laughs> All right. Some people never get there. That's the, that's the point. Some people don't grow beyond that. But we are to grow beyond that. And part of what this season allows us to do is to start practicing. You know, little, give up a little here, give up a little there. Not just to give it up, but to show that you are serious about that relationship with God. In other words, you are not going to allow any material thing good in the way of your relationship with God. That you won't love God any less because you're broke than you would if you had wealth. Do you understand? It helps us to grow closer because we have a relationship that, that is such that we desire that same kind of relationship for everybody. There are some empty people that have everything that you could want in this world. But they tend to be empty because they fill themselves of stuff instead of allowing for the love of God. They've gotten used to just accumulate as opposed to let me build relationships. And one of the things that we, we tend to miss when we talk about this particular season is that we are told to remember some things. Not so we can brag about them, but so we can see God in it. And that's the thing that I hope, us, hope that we will never lose, is that ability to look back and realize that it was God that did all these things for us. Amen. Isaiah also reminds us that we must be careful not to ignore the people in our own family who are also hungry and sick or in some other form of distress. If we do not respond to that, then we are, again, missing the point. You've heard of people who family members say will do anything for the church, but won't lift a finger for family. There needs to be a balance here. Justice is justice, no matter where it is. If you do it one place, if it's really in your heart, you do it everywhere, some kind of way. So he's, again, he's reminding them that you look good doing what you're doing. But what's that got to do with what God told us to do? Amen. Well, quite frankly, some of you know I can be cynical sometimes about church and some of its practices. And not just this church, but some of our things that we do, somebody looking at it would have no clue why we were doing it. They don't know why we wear certain colors and march them down the aisle. Who knows? <laughs> See what I'm saying? And it, it might mean something to us, but who knows? That really needs to understand why we do it. So, so we, we never get be to a place where we feel that what we do is self-explanatory. We are those who, in order to bring others on the journey, are willing to self-expose things that we ordinarily would not talk about. That we do this because there was a time when we had no option but to do that. And there are so many. We could go all day about some of the things, negatives that we learned through the experience of slavery that we turn into a positive. We still use it, but we use it in a positive way. We turn the disrespectful things into respectful things that, that people don't even notice now. You know, why, you know, the way we conduct ourselves when we gather. There are some things about us that just puzzle other people. Like, why you got your finger up when you're walking down the aisle? All those, all those little nuances that, that we picked up on, on how to survive in, in a hostile place, in a hostile time. And so, so, so those, those are the substance of what makes us who we are. Those are the things that we remember 
when we think about the goodness of God towards us, that those things that might have destroyed us instead made us stronger. So when we talk about who we are, we've got to acknowledge that we are who we are because we serve a God that has made a way for us through whatever came. And, it didn't, and the way didn't always seem like the way until we gave it a chance. The way out didn't, the way out sometimes required going past the most dangerous point. We didn't see that until we wound up on the other side. That wall of water that, that appeared, that was called the Red Sea, didn't seem like the way out until they saw the water start to part. But sometimes, if you want something to happen, you just go ahead and start. Don't look at the roadblocks in front of you, but if God says, go, just go. If God says, help this one, help that one, don't stand there talking about, I don't know what to do, just go. And somebody will tell you what to do. So when you talk about who we are. Who we are is those people who have been blessed by God to such a degree that we want the same thing for other people. So we've got to stop sometime and just think about it and ask ourselves, what have we given to the world in proportion to what God has done for us? That's the question now. When you think all over your life, and let's think even back generations, what have we given back to reflect that we appreciate and understand what God has done for us? We shouldn't have to beg in the church for people to do certain things. They should be eager because God has been so good. We shouldn't have to beg for things that, that, that are needed as we go and serve other people because we are a people that God has just blessed in myriad ways, and we ought to be willing to give. Remember back in the day, we used to sing, Is Your All on the Altar? Well, in a way, Isaiah is saying that to the people. Is your all on the altar? In light of what God has done, in light of what God is doing right now, have we given in proportion to what we've been given? Have we provided for others the way that God has provided for us? Have we been available to others the way that God has enabled us to be available for others? So we must be aware that the fast that is a show, not the fast that's a show, the fast that means that I have slowed down. I may give up something and I may not, but what I can do is deepen my relationship. What I can do is look around me and see if there is some way I can help somebody other than myself, then we've got to be willing to sometimes step out, even if we're all by ourselves. And because sometimes we have plenty of company until it's time to go out and do what we said we would do. The fast that restores, the fast that means something to us is the one that causes us to think back on it. To be, to be willing to repent from what we've done. That's what the ashes are about. We, we, we know that we've got some stuff that needs to be gone. So let it go. Some of us are holding on to ashes, and we shouldn't be. Let it go. Let it go. Our God always allows us to have a new start. And my prayer for all of us as we move forward, that we would be open to receive what God has for us, that we would receive not only the good, but we would also receive those things that would cause us to go to our needs in repentance, to recognize we've not always been all that we might have been, that we've not always given all that we might have given, but to understand that as we grow and as we go, we must give our all that others, that others might come to know him the way we know him. So for all of us today, I bid you to continue in this season, remembering all the things that God has done in your lives, what he's done for us through the generations, but remembering most of all that others, others need whatever it is that we've had. And sometimes we forget that. But as we go, 
And as you go through the season, yes, take some time to reflect. Think about it. You'll laugh and you'll cry. That's how it's supposed to be. I didn't understand growing up why sometimes they said, sometimes those two go together. Yeah, they do. You ever laugh till you cry? I mean, so it's, uh, some things just seem not to work together, but they do. So you fast and you pray. The fast being that I'm so sure that God will deliver that I'm going to deny myself. We're required to do that in this season. I am so glad it should be our attitude, that God has kept us the way God has. So even if I have a little bit, I'm going to share it with somebody. That fast, it's not about how much you can give, but the source of the giving, the why of the giving. So if you don't see anything that, that God has done for you, it's probably hard to do for somebody else. But my prayer is, my prayer is that all of us, who have been so richly blessed, would find in that richness the obligation, the determination to share that good news that others would know that God will do the same for them. Would you please stand? The fast that matters is the one that happens in such a way that others know that we've been in the presence of God, that others understand that we are aware that God has brought us this far and that we must rely on God to move from this moment. We become those that matter to others when we show that we care in spite of what they are doing and saying to us, that we show that love that has benefited us all of these years, and in our house of worship, we are striving day by day to be more of that place where God's love is manifest in everything, where we know that we must continue to work together, grow together, that others might come to know him. So if you're here today and you're seeking a church home, you're seeking a place to grow and to learn, and to be in fellowship with God's people, we welcome you today. We'll gladly receive you on Christian experience for baptism. However you come, confessing Jesus is Lord. Confessing He is the Son of God. And that He died and he rose again with all power in His hand. We we'll believe on those, on those things today. We welcome you as a part of this fellowship. The doors of the church are open. then we will excuse those that are not members of the Bethlehem Baptist Church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for a time and a place to worship. We thank you, God, for what we have heard, what we have felt. And Lord, we thank you for what you have purposed in our hearts to do. We ask that you bless us in our going out as you bless us in our coming in. 
Lord, bless all the work of our hands and our hearts that others would come to know you. We thank you, God, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.